Blessings everyone. I am Sandra Walter and I'm here with Glenn Ryan. Dr. Ryan is joining us today to talk about DNA. So um, for those of us who uh, are not familiar with your work, um, how about a couple sentences on who you are and what you do and how you're so deeply, the, the reason why I want to talk to you is because you're so deeply ingrained in so much of the, the platform stuff that so much of the spiritual community kind of rests on as far as bridging um, science. So I was, I was thrilled when I discovered that you were actually the one who discovered um, the whole antenna type uh, theory. theory of how DNA actually serves as an antenna and all of your work with heart math and everything um, that you've done to kind of contribute to this uh, ever-expanding conversation that we're having about DNA. So, um, well, that was a pretty good introduction. Well, there you go. There we right. go. <laughs> oh, well, she probably wants more. So if you've heard it from <laughs> Greg Braden and David and everybody else uh, about DNA being an antenna, this is where it came from. So I thought that was really cool, first of all. Um, that, that you were the guy who, who put that together. But what I found interesting was the more that, um, the more guidance that, that I received and the intel that I've received about uh, torus fields and toroidal fields and how that interacts with the DNA was, um, was very parallel to a lot of the, the work that, that you have been doing and that others have been doing in the scientific community. So our intention with this is to bridge those worlds and go, okay, what are you guys working on? What are we receiving? And how, um, you know, both of us can kind of bounce off of each other and kind of expand the conversation, perhaps get to the stuff that we're trying to get to a little bit faster. So with that introduction, I would just like to say that um, my background is in um, conventional science. Uh, my degree, my PhD is in neurochemistry, neuroscience. And I worked to work at uh, Harvard and Stanford universities. And then when I went to California, working at Stanford University, I met the folks at HeartMath. And at, actually at the time, I was working on DNA and uh, measuring effects of healers to change DNA in, in a little test tube. And HeartMath heard about that. They got all excited. Was, that was probably around the time when Sandra was, was doing all this channeling about DNA and the whole world was tuning into DNA and its mm. higher functions, shall we say. Yeah. And HeartMath found out about uh, my research and got all excited and uh, wanted to get involved with the research. And uh, in the end, I ended up leaving Stanford University to go work at HeartMath. Uh, big move in my career, needless to say, but that was the uh, begin, begin, the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end. Uh, <laughs> end uh, of the beginning, academia. Uh, the, right? the end of that, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say, right. And I left academia at that point and never came back mm -hmm. and have been involved ever since uh, setting up my own lab and doing research in uh, esoteric science because of my own interest in spirituality and my own personal development, I uh, was very interested in working with DNA and uh, was guided to the theory that I published in the 1990s actually about uh, toroidal DNA and its functions because I had discovered in the biology literature that in fact uh, DNA exists as a toroid. So like normally you have the strand of DNA, the two, he the two strands that make up a helix, or helix strand of DNA. Well, sometimes that strand can circle back on itself and then you get a circular DNA, but sometimes that strand can actually wrap itself around uh, into the shape of a toroid. And the fact that biologists had discovered that using electron microscopy, to me, was like, oh my God, that's awesome. Because of, uh, at the time I was also interested in physics, and in the physics literature they talk about toroids, and, uh, this, and the center of the toroid is a catenoid, technically speaking, uh, and the uh, physics community talks about catenoids uh, as being the center of a wormhole, what they call transversible wormholes, that actually allow consciousness 
to pass from one side to the other, and I mean, they don't talk about consciousness in the physics literature, or what well, they do now, but not in those days, okay. which allows the uh, uh, consciousness to go from one dimension to another, so from 4D to 5D or 5D to 4D. And that got me all excited because that's the personal stuff I was working on at the time with my yeah. own spiritual growth. And, that, and I just put it all together and made that theory about how the function of toroidal DNA. Mm -hmm. And that was probably, what, 50, 40 years ago and um, 30 years ago. And biologists still don't know the function of toroidal DNA. So there we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so your time during uh, your heart math experience... Was that, um, so you were part of them putting together the whole heart coherence? Well, they were studying the heart and I was studying DNA. So we decided to um, see if their folks, you know, they don't call it meditation, but they, in essence, are meditating mm -hmm. and uh, generating coherence in their heart. And then we actually discovered that when they were in that altered state, they could influence DNA in a test tube that mm -hmm. in front of them. Mm -hmm. And only when they were generating that coherence in the heart could they affect DNA in a macroscopic level. And in those days, I was measuring winding and unwinding of the two strands because, um, as the video shows, mm -hmm. uh, here's uh, two strands of DNA which are <laughs> uh, able to wind and unwind. And that's what I was able to measure with a spectrophotometer and it could demonstrate that healing energy from the body, uh, bio, I call bioenergy, could actually cause DNA to either unwind or wind depending on the intention of the person. So if your intention is to wind, it will wind and vice versa. Beautiful. And that's and that was back that was nineties back in the nineties, yeah. Which is amazing because I I didn't start doing what I'm doing until ninety nine, um, oh, you know I didn't well, activate it or whatever. So it's really interesting to me that, you know, we talk about unified field and and all of that, and so it's floating out there in the morphogenetic field, and then your yeah, guides come right. along and go point you toward the, the torus and how they all fit together and when you talk about the catenoid we're talking about that actually being in the heart center creating frequencies that you can then resonate with the vibration of your higher self your other levels and layers and dimensions of your own self well that's where your t guidance came in because uh, at the time i was we were just talking about the toroid in the heart because of uh, winfrey's work uh, he's a professor uh, who actually mathematically modeled the shape of the energy fields of the heart. And that was quite revolutionary at the time. That's he, the popular um, image images that, that you get seen. from heart yeah, math, right. about the, tor the torus yeah. field around the heart. And the, right. Yeah, but, yeah. So there is science behind that. Yeah. And then and Sandra's work came and connected it, it, it to the higher self and, and the more spiritual side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, so this so this video is being created. It might go on YouTube later because it's probably going to be a great conversation. But um, this video is being created for uh, mm -hmm. folks who are going through the crystalline DNA class, and so we've got the platform established for um, uh, for pure intention being the foundation of everything. Like nothing mm -hmm. happens without the intention to activate these levels of DNA. And then we go through uh, the <coughs> emotional and the thought processes and the retraining the thoughts and retraining the heart to create this landscape, a canvas for a new creation. And so then we get into uh, what all the different strands, levels, layers, energetic fields, whatever you want to call them, uh, do or what their function is. But what I wanted to bring, um, bring you in for was when we were at Dimensions of Disclosure, we had a very fascinating conversation uh, about how gatekeepers and grid workers are able to interact with the grid systems. So we have uh, a lot of star seeds, uh, folks with stuff in their DNA that is resonating with structures that are in the earth and not just sacred sites, but we're actually revisiting points on the planet and activating and opening these 
stargates, or what we call the new earth grid system, has nothing to do with the ley lines, that, uh, that bridges to the crystalline grid system, which was this, it used to be uh, an off-planet type structure around, we could see it, this crystalline grid that was the intention for ascension, and Gaia was expanding into that, and then on the 121212, 12, she actually created that platform for us to move into. But all of us that are working with these gates and these grids and, and everything else, we were always told it's an aspect of your DNA that's talking to things that you planted in the earth, either etherically or in crystal beds or in uh, ancient stones a lot of the time, or some people work directly just with geometry that are planted in physical places on the planet, and then you're guided to go there, and the next thing you know, you show up and things happen. Just like I was talking about the, the gateway at Mono Lake, just, it's be, it was, I was called there because of my DNA, because of aspects of my DNA that resonate with things that I planted there, or things that we planted there um, back in the ancient days as a forethought for ascension. And the interesting thing is when, when, when my guides talk about uh, quantum DNA, they talk about DNA as a record of everything that you've ever been and everything that you will be, all the different possibilities for your timelines. So it's very connected to the experience of time, but you're also... I mean, time, time technically doesn't exist, so what you're doing is you're kind of going quantum while showing up with your DNA that has that memory in it, that memory field in it, that somehow connects with stuff that you've planted in the ground. So, you want me to address that, and I'd be happy to address that, except there are like 10 points that I want to address, <laughs> and what well, you just said. I can't remember what, where we started last night. We should have turned the camera on last night, because it was really cool. <clears throat> but, uh, well, so first I want to say, um, if only DNA could talk. <laughs> but uh, DNA can listen, uh, and that's part of the antenna theory that I proposed mm -hmm. back in the 90s, because uh, DNA... Uh, particularly DNA, uh, other biomolecules can probably do the same thing, but because DNA is in a toroid, it, it can act as an antenna and receive and broadcast energy. Now, in the science community, it's mostly electromagnetic energy that we talk about, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, DNA can... We, we can communicate with DNA through our consciousness mm -hmm. rather than our words. Right. Although Sa Sandra could probably hear the DNA talking. Most people can't, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 so it, metaphorically speaking. But it's actually a layer of DNA that, ha that does that. That does that, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Right. So we, we just don't have the ears to hear mm -hmm. the language. Well, the language of DNA, there's a Russian scientist uh, by the name of uh, Garyaev who has written several articles about the language of DNA, language of DNA yeah. and uh, that's something you guys could follow up on yeah, um, talk to in the in the internet. But okay, so uh, then, as it happens, I, I think perhaps before you came up with what your ideas that you just shared, I introduced another concept in the scientific literature back in the nineties. Well, actually, it wasn't the scientific literature, because the stuff that I was getting was a little outside of mainstream science, which is why I left mainstream science, mm. so I could do this kind of work. I could not do this kind of work working at Harvard, believe me, or, <laughs> or, or Stanford, for that matter. Really? Uh, yeah, really. So I left and uh, put out this theory about what I call geometric resonance, and that's addressing the heart of what you just said about how um, grid workers can uh, resonate with geometric patterns and structures that are either physical structures or etheric structures mm. because I mean ultimately <clears throat> every physical substance whether it's the heart or whether it's a three-dimensional um, uh, lattice s structure of the earth generates an etheric field and the etheric field will have the same geometry as the physical field. So when we talk about toroidal DNA, the physical DNA exists as a toroid, and then that will generate a toroidal electromagnetic field. And the electromagnetic field will generate a subtle energy field. 
uh, etheric in nature with the same shape. So we have two different systems here, the, the, um, the body, the heart, and the um, physical and etheric structures in the uh, grid lines in the, in, the, um, uh, in the earth. So my explanation to what Sandra mentioned earlier was that there is a geometric resonance mm -hmm. between a, a, a toroidal heart field and a toroidal geometric shape in the earth. But you, then you, you say, well, but the shapes in, in the earth are, are um, not toroidal, they're, you know, uh, tetrahedrons and octahedrons and, and... Yeah, but that's like platonic though, platonic because like when I'm doing solids, gate right. work, which is star gate work, um, there's, it always opens up into a torus. Oh really? Before okay. it becomes something else. Like it's, it births stuff from the, from the core of it. Um, and I, like there, there's a lot of um, gatekeepers and grid workers that do work, that do see um, geometry you know, or they're sending geometry or whatever. Mine is more um, crystalline. I've worked with crystals, and we've been planting crystals all over the place, too, to connect them because there's there's um, something about the silica structure that can handle a lot more information, but it's also interdimensional information, which is why we were talking uh, earlier about, like, the the migration from a carbon to a carbon silica structure to a silica structure and if DNA gets into a silica based structure like then you're like knocking all the doors off because it can handle multi-dimensional information simultaneously. I don't think DNA has doors either. <laughs> but That was a metaphor. That was a, that was a metaphor. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the idea that uh, the etheric energy associated with these structures can resonate uh, geometrically with the etheric um, energy of the heart is kind of what you're talking about. And even in my model, I didn't limit geometric resonance to you know a helix and a helix, a toroid and a toroid mm -hmm. can only talk to each other because in the etheric domain you you can get these transformations so that. Um, I mean, even in mathematical physics, they, you have a toroid, but a toroid can sh shape shift, perhaps is the right word, mm -hmm. uh, into uh, other structures and can transform itself into other structures, and therefore you can um, get resonance between similar structures. They don't have to be exactly the same uh, toroid to toroid. And that's the dynamic nature of the energies that we're working with, especially in the etheric domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the role of consciousness to facilitate or even direct those uh, transformations is an important concept that I'm sure you've covered in your work. Yeah. Uh, and that's well, it was getting the, the code. So, yeah, we've got it in our DNA, but it's getting those, it's going epigenetic and, and turning on codes that are actually connected to other realms in order for that activation to um, to happen because it's kind of I mean not anybody can wander into the middle of Nevada and activate a Stargate like it's it's a certain resonance in your DNA and you you're the one who did it to begin with so then if the timeline ar arises mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're on the primary ascension timeline and you're like, oh, there's that thing that we thought might happen, and you show up in the physical on that higher timeline in the same place that you did something that you know technically is viewed as the past. But I guess in the past we just understood, you know, you could see that perspective of like, okay, if this plays out well, I'll show up in the same place and I'll plant something in the ground in the grids physically. Um, physically, or maybe it's just with intention. I mean, oh. sometimes it's oh. it's crystals, like the crystal bed in through Arkansas. I was all over that thing. I mean, it was just like, wow, I've I've been here before, and all these crystals were like turning on just because I came within that field, and you know how those journeys are when you're guided to go somewhere. But so sometimes it's etheric structures. Sometimes it's like in the crystals themselves, which I find interesting because. 
they also refer to this whole operation as crystalline DNA. And I'm like, well, and we're working with crystals, and we're becoming more crystalline, and then you've got this crystalline aspect of DNA. And I, f I don't know if, um, if that's just the, like I was talking about, the, the slash. Is it crystalline slash Christed slash unified? All meaning the same thing. Um, a level of consciousness that then interacts with matter in a very different way. And when we dug into, like, Marco's paper... Marco Ruggiero. Yeah, because in my model, the second strand is related to time. Oh, okay. It provides the experience of time. And if you're kind of going timeless by showing up somewhere that you haven't been before, there's there's got to be something in the codes of your DNA... Right. It, well, ...that are... Responsible. ...not time-bound. Uh, and this article that recently was published by uh, Professor Marco Ruggiero uh, talks about that, believe it or not. It's the article actually proposes, and, and which is a far-out theory, and for us, it, it's going like, oh, of course, that makes total sense it, based in support <laughs> of what Sandra just said. But the fact that it got published in a peer-reviewed journal, and the reviewers of the journal let it go by, you know, and say, oh, okay, that's a reasonable hypothesis, it is, shows you uh, how much we've evolved, or scientists have evolved. Or maybe they're uh, getting a the cut of for, the, the, uh, the maybe, product. Well, it, 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 it could be a financial thing, but no, no, I mean, that's the whole purpose of peer-reviewed journals, that, that it's stuff that's too far out and not within the conceptual framework of a scientist. Uh, will not get accepted. But anyway, the point being that he proposed that um, when, L when energy, particularly an electromagnetic field, interacts with DNA, that um, the energy adds mass to the DNA. And according to Einstein, uh, when you, you know, like a, in the astronomical domain, when you have a planet and it, with a, a large mass, it slows down time. So there's a relationship between the mass of a particle and the passage of time. And this is Einstein's theory of relativity. And he's taking that concept in astrophysics and bringing it down to the DNA level and proposing that DNA itself can actually slow down time at local sites where there's a special kind of interaction between a protein molecule and the DNA molecule, and that uh, he calls it time dilation. So the concept of slowing down time, that DNA is capable of slowing down time, is a rather novel scientific uh, idea, which is now published and supports what Sandra just said. Yeah, because, well, and when we're, um, there's a, a section in the class on time dynamics because I just love it, I geek out on that. Um, because if DNA is creating our, so... It's Slowing a, down time. Well, it's creating our entire experience oh. of these realms. Okay. Like, I mean, literally they've said, yeah, all this work and everything, it's actually the DNA that is creating, through, through higher self-instruction, creating the experience of density of time, of matter altogether, mm. that it's actually the DNA is the vehicle for that experience. So when you mm -hmm. come in with, hey, it's an antenna and it's, it's receiving signals and broadcasting signals for the rest of the cells, and then my guides come in with like, hey, they're all like magnetically um, uh, attached, and which ties to the whole torus operation of elect electromagnetic toroidal fields being able to talk to each other, I just find it interesting that because the um, because in our collective, the ascending collective is having the experience of leaving time, leaving time dynamics, where time gets much more fluid, or you, it drops off altogether, or it, it'll just stop. I mean, we've had this experience where it's just everything just stops. Yeah. And if that's being created through the DNA, that must be some level of the DNA getting activated that's overriding the codes in the DNA that are telling it to provide the experience of time. Okay, so there we go. Ten more ideas coming out of that one. It's uh, a big so, conversation. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about time reversal. 
because in the physics literature, this is a concept that is uh, legitimate. It's published, and it's a it's a uh, by, byproduct of a process called phase conjugation, whereby ordinary light gets converted into energy, which is described as virtual and time reversed. So this is a mechanism that actually I've recently published an article about can occur in the body. Now, whether it can occur in DNA has not been measured yet, but it does occur in this special kind of complex molecule called porphyrin, which in fact is part of the glycoproteins, which are not DNA, but it's a protein at the surface of the cell membrane. So the fact that uh, time reversal can occur in a bi biological system, and now we have time, um, Ruggiero's work with time dilation, or slowing down of time, uh, indicates that the body is capable of this kind of, uh, uh, generating this kind of energy and they call it virtual energy. So we're not talking about ordinary electromagnetic energy in the four dimensions of space and time. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a higher form of energy. Now, as we said earlier, DNA is capable of converting one kind of energy into another. So in that sense, you could say that DNA is, is able to convert four dimensional ordinary electromagnetic energy into uh, etheric energy, which is time reversed, and therefore, in a sense, is generating time, or at least modulating it. I mean, if it can reverse time, then surely it can generate time. <laughs> but if the but if, if the DNA is informing the cells what to do, right, then it's got to be DNA, right? The root of all evil and good, good, please. in the body, right. would be DNA. DNA, and it's your consciousness <clears throat> that's telling it good, bad. Positive, negative, all that stuff. Yeah, although admittedly that kind of thinking is not in the scientific community yet. Yet. Uh, yet. <laughs> we're very we're, hopeful. We're, I'm working on it, and that's <laughs> why Sandra and I met, apparently, <laughs> so we could, uh, I could, gen uh, I could expand on my original mm -hmm. theory, and since that theory is like 30, 40 years old, I guess it's time to rewrite it, and something Sandra and I will hopefully get an opportunity to, to work on together mm -hmm. because the the concepts that she's talking about are, are you know, they're far out and new age and esoteric, but there's a lot of science that, that supports uh, those theories. And if the scientific community now can accept you know, the fact that DNA uh, exhibits, uh, you know, time dilation, then the stage yeah. is set. Yeah. Because what I want to talk about is uh, the codes. Mm. Uh, a lot of Sandra's knowledge uh, and information has to do with DNA codes. So I want to say that we all know about, from, from a scientific perspective, we all know that about the genetic code. Genetic code refers to the sequence of nucleotide bases that make up the DNA strand. DNA is composed of nucleotide bases, protein is composed of amino acids, whole different animal. Mm. But DNA itself um, has, well, has, has this genetic code. But actually in the scientific literature they talk about all kinds of codes in the body, not specifically in DNA, but that's a reasonable uh, hypothesis. Where is it from? Yeah. Right, that, that, that it also occurs in DNA. They, they have geometric codes, they have, um, they give them really funny names um, that, that uh, are bizarre, but they're talking about information in the molecules, which is, you know, not the, not the information associated with the sequence of the components that make up the molecule, but in the case of geometric uh, information and geometric codes, they're talking about the shape of the molecule. So it turns out that uh, the scientific community has um, defined the all kinds of codes other than the genetic code. They've got binary codes, they've got information codes, they, they, they give them really funny names, um, shape codes, and uh, they, they, this is, you know, literally right out of the physics literature. 
and then they even have zip codes. Maybe it's a, 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 a pun, <laughs> perhaps. Okay. But that's a, another example of, of a code, right? You know, mm -hmm. one location versus another location, right? Uh, and they call them zip codes, but they don't mean geographic locations on the right. planet. They mean perhaps different locations in the body or different molecules. But anyway, the point being that when Sandra talks about DNA activation, um, and uh, of the strands, because we know the 12 strand stuff, which is something we should probably talk about, mm -hmm. because it, uh, it, it, to me that's a difficult concept, because <laughs> DNA only, from a scientific why. point of view, because DNA only has two you physical can't see strands. Because you can't see it. And okay, I can understand it could be etheric strands, yes. and, um, uh, but stay, staying within the realms of science, we, if we talk about activating a code, then that makes a whole lot of sense because the codes are are physical, and uh, information codes are a little more esoteric. But um, the codes can be activated in 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 a way that uh, or turned on in a way that Sandra is talking about. So that kind of makes makes a lot of sense when uh, trying to bring in the science and the spirituality, yeah. which is what we're doing here. Yeah. Well, and then in, in addition to all these codes that I just mentioned, that we also have quantum codes, uh, which are reference to the quantum properties in the body, and it's interesting that DNA, imagine that, exhibits quantum properties. And particularly in the hydrogen bond, which holds the two strands together, uh, the electrons that zip back and forth between one strand and another um, don't hop like ordinarily, but they tunnel. And that tunneling means that if there's a barrier, an energy barrier, it, the electron doesn't have to go over the barrier, it just goes zip right through the barrier. But it's interesting that uh, back in the old days at HeartMath, when we were measuring winding and unwinding, what determines the ability to wind and unwind is the hydrogen bonds that hold the, the um, two strands together. Mm -hmm. So that means that consciousness can resonate with the quantum DNA which is, I believe, somewhere in all of your teachings, mm -hmm. um, the fact that consciousness can uh, mediate everything, and especially when we're dealing with the quantum domain and the quantum level. So, in your experience with HeartMath, was, what was the tie between the, the, the quantum effect of consciousness and the hydrogen bond that got, just lit me up for some reason? Oh. Like, so, the, so it's the hydrogen bond that's responsible for getting it to coil and uncoil? Wind and unwind. Yeah. Uh, coiling is a, is, is a different phenomenon. Well, the winding and unwinding. Unwinding of the, the, of the two strands. Right. Right, and that the fact that measured, what I measured in the lab was the winding and unwinding of the two strands, that process, both of those processes, are mediated by forming or breaking of hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds exhibit this quantum property of quantum tunneling, mm -hmm. so therefore we can say that consciousness affects the quantum properties of DNA. Now, uh, they're, they're doing some work like that in, um, in ions, uh, the guy from IONS who is working with quantum properties of light and showing that consciousness can influence how light uh, bends and moves. Mm. So they're, all right, so, so they're kind of backing up the light worker conversations because we see and direct light all the time. I mean, that's the, that's the, yeah. mas that's the mastery yeah. skill, right. is being able to Right. To use and direct light with your with your consciousness um, and with your pure intention, and the more purified you get, the more coherent your light beams get. Just like what Vogel's doing with the crystals, it's you you uh, create a more coherent beam um, of of your own your own light, uh, the, the ability to actually make light more coherent through your coherent. Field, which may be connected 
to why, um, just going back to why grid workers are able to show up in a certain location um, with that with that pure intention. There's got to be something like maybe there's a light quotient. A lot of times we've heard about like light quotients being met, so that certain things can it's it's like little um, time locks that happen with the collective consciousness hit, hitting a certain light quotient or your own personal self reaching a certain light quotient and what I was shown is like it's actually something that's being created through the DNA that the DNA when we get maybe we should get into like bioluminescence or something yeah like well, that. Right, exactly yeah well so yeah because what well, perhaps the light quotient is another word for the degree of coherence of the light is it brighter that I well know. I mean it always not, looks brighter well, well the, the the light can be either uh, changed in frequency or actually wavelength or intensity or co or the degree of coherence mm -hmm. and what's particularly relevant for this conversation is that DNA itself is this source of light but the light that comes out of DNA actually when you unwind the two strands you release the trapped stored light that's in the DNA this was discovered by a German scientist by the name of uh, Fritz Popp and it turns out that that kind of light is different than ordinary photons and they he gave it the name biophotons because ordinary photons ordinary light is not coherent but biophotons are very coherent in fact sure we can make co light coherent by making a laser beam but the biophoton light is even more coherent than the most coherent form that man can make with light the laser and the source of that it, is, does it come, is DNA it does it come from anywhere else oh well they haven't figured that out in the body you mean biophotons oh, anywhere well in, biophotons anywhere are unique is there this unique biophotons are kind unique. of light that's only in the DNA well it probably exists well it exists in plants remember the old phantom leaf uh, experiments yeah. they did when you cut the top part of the leaf and you take a picture of it and yeah. you see the whole etheric yeah. energy uh, and what you see is the light so that's but light. wouldn't that be like a DNA signature well, that's what, what uh, Paponin and, and um, Garyev did. They did the same thing with light. Mm -hmm. They didn't cut the DNA in half, but <laughs> they removed the DNA and took a picture of the light that it was coming off of the DNA. And even wasn't it uh, Paponin that yeah, Paponin um, and said, and wow, Garyev. it lasts for like 30 days? With the signature <clears throat> of the DNA like stayed uh, for 30 days, uh, even uh, after the DNA was gone? It was gone, right, exactly. Yeah. And so what they're actually measuring is a kind of light. So now we have two separate experiments showing that, that DNA is the source of the light in the body. So that is uh, highly and, relevant. All right, so let's get geeky and we'll tie it into, all right, so we'll tie it into time. So why is the DNA lasting, giving a lasting impression in space, in water, wherever, after the DNA is gone? Wouldn't that be some kind of time dynamic, like imprinting the field? <clears throat> Okay, I hadn't thought of it that way. So if DNA is responsible for a time experience and it's kind of like stamped in a place and then it moves somewhere else, like it's it's like interwoven with time dynamics, like a collective time dynamic. Well, yes, in the sense that ordinarily energy coming off of a, of a source, whatever it's a biological source or a physical source, if it's a physical source, you turn off the switch and the energy dissipates and dies off very very rapidly now the fact that that saints uh, and gurus and you know have an energy field that that lasts for years after they pass mm -hmm. uh, and their biological functions uh, keep working or maintain then then it suggests that that time dilation is going on here that things get slowed down to the point where the light doesn't dissipate mm -hmm. like it's supposed to in ordinary situations, but it, it, it lingers. And one way for it to linger would be to slow down time. And if we're, for all the mystery school mastery practices are all about bringing more, you know, we are always focusing on bringing more light and visualizing more mm -hmm. light and commanding the DNA to create more light 
So DNA does indeed have this biophotonic property to it, it would make sense that if a master could rep, I mean, we're, we're getting into that now, it's like telling the DNA, the master DNA, to replicate that throughout your entire system. So if you get a trillion cells all operating at maximum biophotonic quality or frequency, then when a master leaves the body, it would leave a huge impression in the field if it was that coherent. And <coughs> so, so it's an interesting question, and it's something that you could actually measure in the lab. Can consciousness create coherence? Um, uh, a, a, a German scientist by the name of Froelich was the first person to talk about biological coherence. And of course in those days they weren't talking about the role of consciousness, but the fact that um, coherence exists in the body and is an integral part of health and functioning in a normal, healthy kind of way, that it would make a lot of sense that consciousness could actually do that and make light more coherent. And that's never been measured, but that's mm -hmm. a reasonable uh, experiment to do. I think mm -hmm. I'll go back to the lab tomorrow and <laughs> Great idea. That. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, I think, is a good place to stop. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for your attention, and it's been a pleasure <laughs> chatting with you. you Thank you, you so much. You? Cool. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just, I'm actually, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to have these conversations. Thank you, everyone. Blessings.